Hello everybody, uh, welcome to this lockdown lecture. Uh, welcome Shravan, uh, it's very really nice from India. Uh, that's great, that's amazing. Uh, I'm gonna shut for a couple of minutes just to have everybody um, settle and be ready and then we're gonna start, okay? Uh, in the meantime, yeah, uh, welcome. Uh, this, uh, I hope, is gonna be uh, interesting and fun. Hi, Sarah. Uh, that's great. Hi, Marcus. April. Oh, wow. Many people. That's really nice. Um, quite ready to start, to be honest. Uh, I'll be, I'll be going, I think, in a couple minutes. Just, just wait a couple minutes to have people, uh, joining, uh, and then uh, we start talking about games. <laughs> so I, I hope you will like. Hi, Jada. Hello, hello, everyone. Wow, it's a lot of people. <laughs> That's really cool. That's really great. Hello. Wow, a lot of people from India. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Hello, hi. Korea, oh wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's really amazing. Um, all right, um, I think we can start really. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, being here, very happy that I can uh, give this lecture as part of the lockdown lectures. Uh, so I'm home uh, and my name is Fede uh, and I'm a game designer and a creative technologist, uh, which means that I code in a creative way, I guess. Uh, it's something that has come quite recently. I worked a little bit in virtual reality for The Guardian and I was like halfway between being a developer and a designer, even though my background is mostly in game design. And I lead the MA in independent games and playable experience design at Goldsmith. Uh, which is a degree where we basically learn how to make games, make independent games, uh, and how what games mean and how we can add uh, meaningful content to games. Which is part of what I'm talking about today uh, to, to you, uh, because I want to start with a very, very basic thing that is what game actually means and like do we need a definition for that and how with will this definition work really um but for starting uh talking about games we need to start talking a little bit to start talking a little bit about play um and for talking about play i want to i'm very good thank you <laughs> um i want to just go back in time uh, a little bit uh, go back to 1952 uh, in Fleisch Hacker Zoo in San Francisco, California, which is a beautiful zoo. Uh, it's a really, really nice area. And here in 1952, there was a group of anthropologists, philosophers, and linguists, and they were filming animals. And these animals were occupied in a very important and very peculiar activity, which I summarized like that. Uh, so otters in that zoo are pretty much big thing. They are kind of like the owner of the zoo, really. And they were playing. Otters and monkeys and other animals, they were all playing. Uh, and so one of these people, one of these scientists, was the anthropologist Gregory Bateson. And he was really, really interested in what does it mean uh, for animals to play? Because he was thinking, we, we never maybe thought uh, about the fact that we as human, it's very easy for us to decide that we are playing, right? Because we have language to communicate that. So we know when we enter a play space, right? But for the animals, it's not exactly like that, right? Because, because they can't talk. So they, have, they must have a different way to communicate it. And he came up with this observation, which seems like quite convoluted, but it's actually uh, very, very spot on. And I think it's like it's been the base of my understanding of playing games uh, since I just came uh, onto this. Uh, and that's play is a phenomenon in which the action of play are related to or denote 
other action of not, not play, which seems, seems, seems to be like a very, very confused sentence. But actually what it means is think about when animals play, they bite each other. And that bite is exactly like an aggressive bite, but it's not the same. They can, they can communicate this bite as it looks like a bite, but it doesn't stand for a bite. It's something else, it's playful interaction, right? So this thing is the basic of what play is, doing an action, but meaning something else with the action that you're doing. But wait, wait a minute, because that is really, really interesting. I, I come from a perspective of studying media and language, and that is exactly what language is about a set of symbols that stand for something else, right? So we can say that play is actually a language that we learn to talk. And it's a language that doesn't stay forever, but it's, it's just existing the space of play and then just fades off. And the same thing happens with games because games are a structure expression of play, right? So think, think about this, you have a ball, and you start playing with the ball. Uh, so maybe you bounce the ball against the wall or, or you start just bouncing it uh, on the ground or you throw it away. You, do, you can do many things with the ball just because the, the ball is you know, that sort of object that allow you to do those things. But then you meet a friend and the friend uh, takes two bags and put it on the ground, put them on the ground, right? And, and your friend tells you, tells you, okay, now we can hit the ball just with your feet or our head, and we need to try to find a way to have the ball pass this line delimited by the two bags. And instantly you have football, which is a game. And you can see like the transition is giving structure to something that is unstructured, but it, that you already are already doing, is this passage between play and game. So, game this is the realm where i'm working on i i am absolutely obsessed by games uh, i really want to understand why we play games how we play games what do we do when we play games and all i i got so so many questions that i just con continuously think about um but you know what what do you do usually as you want to study something you want to understand what it is this thing that you want to study so you you need definitions right so we need to talk about uh about definitions uh a little bit uh so before i show you uh some game definitions i would like if you can in chat try to write not a definition of what a game is but features and characteristics that for you belong to games something that if if there is not that thing, so probably we are not talking about the game, we are talking about something else, because it could be like a first step for, for getting to a definition. And then I will comment some of them maybe, or we put them together and we see what, uh, what comes uh, out from that. But let's see, uh, I've got some, um, some people uh, across the week, they uh, try to come up with their own game definition. And I got some of them, they're really, really interesting. Uh, they're, they're, they're all like really uh, spot on and they have like many interesting things to talk about. For example, there is the, the most like, the most simple one is fun activity. So a game is a fun activity. That's cool. Sarah challenge, that's great. Lighting and aesthetic, that is interesting. Anyway, fun activity. So fun activity is like the broadest and the narrowest definition that I can think of uh, for a game because um, it seems to be so broad, right? But actually fun is kind of a problematic term because uh, we can't really define exactly what is fun because uh, it's extremely sub subjective. Um, so it just like narrowed down the field quite a lot to think that are fun for someone and activity it implies action it implies into into um and the other one is an experience with a defined goal create with the goal to please i really love this because i find this recursive so if you think about it uh we are saying that a, a game is an experience with a defined goal and it's created with the goal to please. So the act of creating a game 
as a defined goal, is, is an experience with, it, with a, a defined goal. So it's the act of creating a game is a game in itself, maybe. It's interesting, right? Uh, there are like so many different aspects uh, and I'm seeing in the chat just like a lot of different things that we have uh, as game characteristics. I'm coming to that in, in, a, in a while. Uh, but now I want to show you one of the probably most important and most accepted um, definitions of game, which is the one that comes from the 2003 book uh, Rules of Play by Katie Salin and Eric Zimmerman, which is a seminal book. It's kind of like the foundation of the modern game studies, so it's very, very important. And they say that the game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules that results in a quantifiable outcome. Uh, interesting. But also, I can criticize that because, you know, artificial conflict Yes and no. There's like, I don't think conflict is always part of a game. Uh, it can be or it can't be. And of course you can say that even when there is no explicit conflict, there is a sort of a conflict that you put yourself through when you play a game, but it's like kind of stretching it a little bit. And the same thing goes with a quantifiable outcome, which connects to the idea of a goal actually. But there are games that don't really have a quantifiable outcome. And many scholars have tried to adjust that saying, yeah, but you know, in a game like The Sims, you create your own goals and then you decide if you have met or them or not. But is that actually the experience that you have playing such games? Because I don't really make goals uh, and it doesn't really matter if I want to do a particular thing and I don't get to it. It's just the the other kind of experience that counts and make it a game for me. So it's kind of like strange territory here. It's not like completely, you can, you can question and argue with these things uh, a little bit and, and maybe just there are like some weak points, uh, which doesn't uh, mean that this, um, this definition is not valid. It's very valid and it's very good. It means something else though. I'm going on with another definition, which is completely at the antipodes of this, because this one is very serious, it's very academic, and this one is completely crazy. It's a game, it's some combination of the following indivisible elements, skeleton, red key, score thing, magic door. If you see something that looks like a video game, but isn't, you should notify the police. And this comes from the independent game developer and artist, Stephen the Catamites. And I think this is really, really important because it says like, it, use, it uses an ironic and very comedic sort of register, but he's saying very, very important things. Look at the wording a little bit. Uh, one thing, uh, and I will go to that a little bit later, is this idea that is some combination of some elements. But the second part, the police part, that is where things get interesting because what he's saying is that a game definition couldn't be prescriptive. It couldn't be something that keeps something out of the game realm because there is some sort of authority that decides according to a definition, this is a game, this is not a game. So this definition, I think it's very, very important because it has a content that goes out of like mere, you know, study formalist, formalist study of the thing, but it, it kind of puts in the responsibility and the effect of creating a definition. So we go on because of course I've got my own game definition. I'm a game designer and I did it. Uh, so 10 years ago or so, I come up with my own game definition. I want to think about what games are for me. And I think a game for me is this. So I define a game as a system capable to generate emotions through agency in a ritual space. Uh, I'm gonna stop on a couple words here. One is emotions. For me, emotions are fundamental for games because we leave a game experience because we want to feel something. We want to feel a particular emotion. And the task of a game designer is to create a space that enables those emotions. 
And then the system. I think the system is a very important word because what we create is a system of rules and things that work in a slightly different way uh, than the real world. And we just go inside that thing and we accept those rules as part of the game. And I want to point out your attention on the concept of a ritual space, because I think games have a lot in common with ritual, because they are in a way, they're same thing, right? A way to enter a different world through some sort of set of rules. Think about the rituals that are going on in your everyday life, which can be, you know, uh, rite of passage like marriage, for example. Uh, they all have a very, uh, a very clear code and set of rule and the language, right? And you accept that language and you accept that when you go inside that. You're not really changing, right? You are the same person if you marry someone. But as something that has changed at a different level because you have accepted that ritual, you believe in that ritual, right? So that is like a, a, an important part for me, like games are uh, have the same thing. Uh, um, as rituals, they are like sort of secluded word that you have to accept. And I'm kind of getting to the point here. Uh, so I wrote this, uh, when, I, when I wrote this, uh, I, I, tweet, I tweeted this, and that's an error. <laughs> Just don't do that. Because like in three minutes, got an answer. That is the answer. And someone told me, oh, well, when I file my taxes, I'm generating emotions through agency in a ritual space. And I'm like, yeah, fair. That is, that is exactly the point. The point is that I can make all the definition of games that I want, but if you don't accept something as a game, then that will, will never be a game for you, but it's highly subjective. So maybe for some people, filing taxes is actually very entertaining and it's a game. So, uh, so this is uh, kind of, you know, the, the, the starting point of all this. If we can see game and play as a language, then accepting that language and willing to speak it makes it a game. Otherwise, we're not going on that. Okay, uh, they're asking me if I'm familiar with Alan Moore's thought of magic and ritual. Not directly, I read some of uh, Alan Moore's uh, works, but uh, no, I haven't uh, really gone into that. Probably something that I should do. <laughs> so I'm giving you an example of how it's your attitude that really makes a game. This example is called Finchley Central. Finchley Central is a great game, which is perfectly formed and responds to pretty much all of the uh, game definitions that we have seen. So it works this way. It has just two simple rules. Two players take turn in naming London underground stations. That's pretty straightforward. The first player naming Finchley Central wins. So, <laughs> So this is formally a game space, but you can't really play this game without challenging its formal aspects, because if you just go for the challenge, of course you start the game, you look at the other player and you go, Finchley Central, I won, right? That is like, that is of course a thought experiment, but we think about that. What happens sometimes when I have uh, people playing this game is that the person who is starting looks awkwardly at the other person and is just like, well, I can't be that, especially here in Britain, I can't be that unpolite, so uh, I will say Liverpool Street. And then the game goes on and the other person is like, okay, okay, you got me into this, so I just don't want to immediately win. So maybe I will see, I don't know. Oxton. And, and the game goes on, but the game goes on because the two players have decided to, to challenge uh, a formal aspect of the game. So my question is, do we need to call the game police as a, a game crime being committed here? I don't think so. I just think that a game first and foremost is defined by the players and the creators. The creators create a space and give you a possibility. And you, as the player, when you enter the game space, you accept or it as a game or not. And in this sense, as I said, we go on 
with the parallel with ritual and we come back to language and meta communication because it's all about that it's all about accepting that this system of things that i i, I the game creator i've created is something that you want to play with right and you accept as a game i give you another example of this i really like this thing so this has been made um for together with the transport authority in amsterdam where this uh, design firms is called Ad, had made and basically it's this little game that is just two stickers on a tram in amsterdam and one is the rules and the other one is that little monster so basically what you do is close your eyes one one of your eyes and you have to catch people with this little monster that is stuck on the tram window and you can easily understand how all of this is just your attitude that makes it a game otherwise it's just a, literally stickers on a window it's not much more than that right so so the problem with the game definition is exactly that is that as much as you can define a game you will always lack the fact that you need a sort of approval by the players that want to enter this the space to accept it as a game so uh, the problem with definitions in general is they tend to be a little bit constraining right so you know uh, especially in a broad field like games that can assume so many aspects because right now maybe some of you are thinking about video games some of you are thinking about board games some of you are thinking about I don't know interactive theater some of you uh, are thinking about something completely different, right? So it's really difficult to put them in a box. And if you make a definition, you put a game in a box and you start, you start saying, hey, if you don't have challenges, not a game. And then it comes out a game where there is no challenge. And what do you do with that? You're not accepting, accepting as a game. So let's see what you have uh, written on, on, on the chat. I'm, I'm gonna read some of them, but I'm gonna move to this slide. So I'm gonna explain what this means in a minute. So we have seen, there are like things, uh, so scoring system. Yeah, some games have a scoring system. Some other games don't have a scoring system. It's not totally necessary. Even in the uh, definition of the catamites, it's, I think deliberately uh, put in a sort of a very, very uh, kind of vague way. So it, it doesn't really say, it doesn't really say the game has to be all, uh, all of these characteristics, right? It's just some combination of these things, right? So player, player, okay, player is, uh, is good because player for sure. Uh, if there's not the player, probably uh, the game is like, it, it's sort of like, becomes a philosophical problem uh, if you know a tree falls in a forest and nobody's there as the tree fall and it's kind of the same thing right rules uh yes there are games that are a little bit more free form like think about some sort some sort of like uh free um live action rpg that don't have so many rules uh you need definition for marketing purposes. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> You're so right, Sarah. Yeah, there, there, are, there, there are cases uh, where, where you really need definitions. So there's like framing, uh, visuals, uh, an artistic medium that put the audience in an interactive role. This is uh, a, a definition. I think games are polythetic. Uh, so polythetic is a very academic term. Um, that essentially means that you can't define them uh, by listing features that pertain to all of instance of that category. So basically you are saying, uh, I can't tell you a list of things that if you check all of these things, then you have a game. And the same thing happens uh, with religion and ritual. Like anthropology of religion, I've studied a lot this kind of thing. Uh, and yeah, games are kind of like that, the same thing. You can't really, you can see and, and tell this is a game when you see one, but you can't really make a definition. And, and it's not the case that many games have, are religious in nature. They started as religious device or devices to 
uh, for negotiating power in a society, which I think it's very, very interesting. It's, uh, it's so deep. Um, I'm gonna have to rush a little bit because I'm, I'm, I'm running late. Um, how is that different to other mediums of art? Uh, well, it's about context, I think, and background. It's what like the, the what's what's around that makes it more of a game. I think a game definition should be more like a map, like a system of your values and belief about what a game space is and how does it work. And you put a pin on this map and you are there. Your game definition puts you in this like huge landscape that is like vastly unexplored uh, uh, and you start there. And I think the point of the, the, the point where you place yourself on the map is determined by a very specific thing, which is the tension between play and game. So how much you have free space or how much you have structure kind of, kind of moves this thing around and, and you puts it in different places of the map. And this thing, I think uh, I got inspired uh, by David O'Reilly, who is a um, is an independent game developer who made a game called Mountain. Uh, and he says this thing, which really resonates with me about how he plays a game. Uh, and it's usually he's more interested in whatever is on the background. So sometimes it's just like, you know, uh, killing all the monsters and just enjoying and explore the, the, the place. And he thinks more in terms of play, more in terms of what I can do. I, I just like do things that are pointless that I don't care because uh, 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 with play you can't really fail. Uh, and he made a game that summarized this vision quite a lot, which is Mountain, which is basically a game where all you do is look at the mountain and the mountain doesn't do much, right? It just stays there. And sometimes some objects pop and you can just observe them, but it's not, you, you might say, oh my God, there is no challenge here. There is no interactivity. Wait a minute, there is interactivity. There is like, like choosing to observe and paying attention to something is a really, really interactive way of looking at things. Um, so, you know, when, when O'Reilly made Mountain, he commented on this game this way. He said that mountain is a kind of visual silence. You can't control parts of it, but it's more about letting go of control, which I think it resonates with me because it connects me to someone else who talks talked about silence and comes from music. And it's like equally breakthrough. So at some point, a, mu a musician named John Cage made uh, a piece of music called 433, which is four minute and 33 seconds of completely empty music sheet. So the, uh, the orchestra doesn't play anything. And people started saying, okay, but that's just silence. That's not music. And John Cage says, no, there is no such thing as silence. What you think is silence is just because you don't know how to listen. It's full of accidental sounds. And he makes a very, very important remark about music ears. And actually he opened an entirely new way of making music because uh, he defied the very, very definition of music. And in a way, what David O'Reilly did was exactly the same, just like do visual silence, something that you don't have to do the usual things that you do in a game to appreciate it. Uh, and also there is an important part of this tension between play and games that what I noticed is that if we have a space for unstructured play, the game can get more easily subversive because when you, when you can do different things, you can start criticize the game space itself. You can start a conversation with the game creator, but also just really be subversive. And I give you some example of that with a very recent game, but before that, Indie games do that all the time. And uh, a lot of people like to tell, to say that uh, the Goose game is actually a very political game because it's all about disrupting society uh, and creating confusion. But I want to talk a little bit more about another game, which is Animal Crossing. So I'm totally obsessed about right now. Uh, I think many of you probably are obsessed quite a lot about this game because it's very, very successful uh, and Animal Crossing has this huge space for playing and for making 
this different content emerge. You can create your own content, you can combine the millions of, of objects in different ways, uh, you can create different spaces and different meaning. So you can recreate famous artworks, for example, like this beautiful example of the obliteration room, or you can do protests like people in Hong Kong did started protesting inside Animal Crossing because they couldn't go out. And then the Chinese government banned the game and stopped selling it. And you know, without even going that far, there are people that just challenge the very meaning of the game, a game which is like extremely cheerful, extremely relaxed, and then they build their own island like this incredible horror story village with like where everything is super creepy uh, and super strange and i kind of love this uh you know it's like a way to criticize the game to say hey this is not as not to be positive all the way it can be something completely terrible but also just sometimes using that space for hanging around with friends and to have like this sort of uh playful uh, space where like the mechanics and the aesthetic of it kind of enable that sort of conversation. And I'm going to wrap up right now by getting back to our map and saying that games, uh, a game definition is something that is necessarily personal uh, and it's valid. Um, and I think everybody should start thinking about if you want to make a game, start thinking about what is a game for you. Um, but the thing is, it just like places you on this map. Uh, and I like to think about the game definition as like setting a base camp on the map where you just start exploring this world and you start from your system of beliefs and you know, you start looking around. And maybe at some point, you will realize that something else had caught your attention and you plant another base camp and you explore another little piece of that work. But like, what is really important is that whatever you create, if there's even just one person accepting it as a game, then you are adding up to this landscape. And that is a game. It's another dot of this map. It's another part of this language. It's another way that we have learned about speaking this language. So that is like my final message for you, basically. So uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for being here with me today. If you have any questions, I will leave like uh, five to 10 minutes to answer to any question that you might have. Uh, these are all my contacts. So f.pache at golded.ac.uk is my email. Uh, Kurai is my handle on Twitter and Instagram. You can add me, DM me, please follow me. Kurai.eu is my personal website and medium.com slash workerizing is my weblog uh, where I talk about games. Uh, and if you like Animal Crossing, I've got a very, very long article about Animal Crossing and what it means in these weird times. So I'm going to leave it to you. Uh, do you have any questions? For me, uh, I'll be happy to answer right now. In the meantime, while I wait for uh, questions to come, uh, next week there will be no lockdown lecture. We will be back on June the 3rd uh, and we will have uh, uh, Helen Pritchard, who is the head of digital arts computing. She's awesome and i really 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 urge you to come and listen to her because she's absolutely amazing uh, and i'm sure that her lecture will be mind-blowing thank you thank you so much thank you for being here that's been really really fun doing this so i take there are no questions if you have any you can tweet them at me i will answer to you this would be a really nice way to uh start the conversation which is like a very cheeky way to say follow me on twitter <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah thank you so much 
It's been awesome. I think I was kind of off center on the camera. They will yell at me. <laughs> uh, okay, how long have I been in the game dev sector? Um, okay, uh, yeah, quite a long time. Uh, it's been almost 20 years now, on and off. Um, I'm not, I, I'm, I haven't always been in games games. So uh, that's been a good amount of time that I've been like in an entirely different sector, which was game de uh, web development. But then um, I did a lot of work uh, with museums uh, uh, and installations and stuff like that. So I worked on a more like sort of playful interaction kind of uh, panorama. Uh, but yeah, it would be like, I, I think I started like in the late 90s. Uh, Um, I mean, uh, that's a very interesting question, Sarah. Uh, do you think that a game needs to have a certain number of game-like elements? So for, ex for instance, if the game doesn't have explicit challenge, does it need to make up for it with some other element? I think, I think that the problem is that you can't really quantify it. You can't say, oh, the game has to have like three gamey elements. Because sometimes this, it's like kind of fuzzy and it kind of stems by the interaction of things. Um, and even agency is something that, you know, we, we thought a lot about, uh, we thought a lot about, you know, uh, games have to be interactive. And then at some point comes up a games like Proteus or games like Dear Hester, which like are just like listening to a story uh, and moving around a nice landscape. And we're like, is this interaction? Uh, and we figured that probably it is. So uh, I don't think like it needs to make up to it with some other element. I just think that uh, there are like, the, w when there is a space uh, that is conceived for like this sort of suspension of rules uh, and, and uh, there is a sort of message or something that the game designer wants to tell you, or wants you to experience, then you probably are in, uh, in front of a game uh, system that you are trying to express within a game space. Um, it's very hard, like the say it's very hard. Like if you can deliver your message in a very simple way, like in a way that the players immediately get it, uh, it's very hard because uh, we are in second order design. So we can't control what the player feels. We can control what we put inside. So it takes a lot of testing um and it takes a lot of study of how simple game mechanic can stand as a metaphor for something else and support it with the aesthetic of the game as well uh in a way that the metaphor becomes quite clear a good example of that could be gray uh which is a game about grief uh and it's not a particularly great game but it makes the point in a very strong way uh because everything is just connected to this idea of uh, just elaborating grief um what is the key difference between indie game and commercial games? Um, well, it's again, that is a fuzzy definition. Right now, saying indie kind of, I don't know, it's just like, it's been like the void of its meaning because what was an indie five, 10 years ago is not the same thing that is an indie right now. And we can argue if I do something not for commercial reason, I am an indie, but there are indie that do things for commercial reasons. So I think that the difference kind of lies in the perspective that you get, which is usually more like bottom up than top down. Uh, and is usually more uh, connected to wanting to deliver a message, but it's not always true, but yeah, it's kind of like one of the uh, main differences, I guess. Is it possible to have a game without interaction or does a lack of interaction mean it cannot be defined as one? This is interesting. Uh, like, I think we have a problem with interactivity and interaction with these words. Uh, yeah, indie have less budget, that's very true. Um, Cause uh, my God, what is not interactive? Like if I decide to take part in an experience, I'm already interacting with it. 
I like for me it's very difficult to think about something that is not interactive for me a movie is interactive a, uh, a book is interactive it's not true that other media are not interactive and games are it's just like you know when when you when you read a book you have a lot of interaction your imagination runs wild you imagine the characters you imagine the voices you create the world in your head and it's just like this is the power of language and that's why i like to see games as a language rather than as like other thing because uh, because uh, it it helps me a lot just just staying on that can you share some reference of intersection between live performance theater and games uh i think this is a question more like for sarah than for me uh i think what was the book I can't remember. I just I just will have to look it up for you. Sorry, I just <laughs> I just escape in my mind right now. There are a couple of books for sure that that can shed some like shed some light on that. Um, so, what particular area in game development did I work in? Uh, game design, mostly game design. A little bit of development, but was more like for just building prototypes. Is there some use to consider play in its tactile sense? A game is fun to play when it has the quality of play. I is is in some way malleable. I want. I'm like. I like your point, Tim. Uh, I really like it. Uh, the idea of malleable is very central. I think. Um, I would say. The problem is the problem that I have with what you're saying is the word fun. For me, the word fun is problematic because it implies that you need to have positive emotions out of a game, and it's not necessarily what's happening. Uh, but you know, uh, we can say we can say the game has like a playful content uh, when it has the quality of play. That would be something that I'm uh, more on. Uh, People wanting to venture into game industry to work as indie developers. I think Sarah already uh, answered to this, uh, but yeah, I'll double on that. Uh, portfolio, 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 portfolio. Make things, make things. Show what you can do. Show your ideas, show your prog progression. The first games you make, you would be terrible. That doesn't count, that doesn't matter, that will teach you to do better next time. And, and if you can see the evolution, one of the things that I do in my course, I, I'm taking a game designer and I'm taking some of their games from like early stage to just like growing up and we can see how the way of thinking kind of changes over time. And that is very, very important because you learn things and you learn how to do things better, you know? Uh, so uh, definitely, uh, portfolio is very important in making things. What are your opinions of critiques of video games being a counter-revolutionary force that drops the proletariat of their drive to implement social change and infantilize them? That is a great question. Oh my god, I could give like 10 lectures on that. <laughs> that is a really... That is why I advocated for more playful content, actually. Because I think that games in their like structured way and when they become all about measuring yourself, they are the perfect expression of capitalism because it's all about measuring, right? Which is like capitalism is founded on the thing that you can measure things. That's why I like to escape definition because they are not measurable. If, if I can't measure a thing, then it's interesting to me. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, uh, there is a point on that. I think that even, you know, when the media starts saying, oh, video games make you violent or like all sort of thing, uh, I really don't like uh, when uh, game people answer just like raising their shields and saying, no, that's not like that. There are studies that, of course, there are studies that say that it's not true. But I think, but I also think that we should be more critical on our industry in general. We should be really more critical. Uh, we should start thinking about, you know, it's like, it's not that uh, saying, okay, Call of Duty will make you a mass shooter. But it's more like saying, Call of Duty is so popular. Why is that? What, what does it say, the fact that Call of Duty is so popular about our society? 
that is the interesting question to me. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question actually, but I think I think that sort of critique need to kind of mature a little bit and become something you know <clears throat> a little bit more about media critic rather than just saying uh, let me see uh, what do you think about future of video games I don't know I'm more concerned about future of humanity right now to be honest <laughs> no I'm just kidding uh, future of video I just don't know I mean, uh, it's just such like, I just hope that people s start exploring a little bit more. And I really, really, really want to see more people doing personal games. That is something that I desire because I think we need more and we need more like maturing like the medium and accepting other point of view and accepting other creators that not co are coming from the game industry directly, but they come from other kind of experience so they can bring their own expertise. So that's more like a hope. Uh, and what I'm working towards rather than, you know, um, rather than uh, saying the future of video games is, will be this. Uh, oh, that's, uh, I love this question. Is it possible that a player plays a game and doesn't know, know that it's a game and the game is still a game? Uh, when it, it, there's at least one person knowing that it's a game, then yes it will still be a game but there are ethical implications on the people that are involved in a game without knowing it's a game so and i uh i talk about that quite a lot in my lectures because uh because it's a little it's kind of an important point in per pervasive game for example uh Oh, the book reality is broken that's really fun yeah i i read it and i i know the uh jay mcconigal was the person who wrote it um could you argue that interactive films like black mirror bandersnatch count as game or do they fall into their own sort of category i think their bandersnatch is is absolutely game it's just a, an interactive novel it's not a particularly good one uh, to be honest, but I think it's also uh, very important uh, in the way how it raises uh, a lot of uh, uh, of back things of the game industry that people don't know about. Um, cool books on the topic you should read. I really love Deep Games by Doris Rush. I think that is a brilliant book about making meaning in games. Uh, Catherine is is Pister, uh what was the title uh why game move us i think is another really good uh really good one um understanding comics it's a beautiful book about making games if you believe me it's not as much about making comics as it is about making games uh Compared to films and drama, do you think it can play a better role of storytelling or value expression? No, I think they can do a different thing. I think, uh, I think that they coexist because they do things in a different way. And if you think about films and literature, they storytell in a very different way by using very different techniques. And I think games can do it in an entirely different way, which is not necessarily better or worse, it's just different. Theory of Fun is a very good one, yes, yes. It's a very great uh, book. No, I'm not implying that. I'm not implying that uh, the majority of games are unoriginal and are clones. I'm, I'm just saying that I want to see more people use games as a form of expression even if it's not for you know making money because that makes mm, a sort of like very fertile terrain for good ideas to emerge 
I'm not saying that uh, that the majority of game I see now are unoriginal or are clones. There are many of them that they are, but they are also like brilliant, brilliant inventions. Uh, but I think we need that. We need people to use this sort of uh, uh, mean of expression. All right. I guess it's probably what makes a game truly different. It's about the story attached to the game. I think it's more about what do you do in the game space and how do you do it. Uh, it's a combination of things. And it's like very difficult for that scene because, you know, um, for a movie, you have a language that is very established. For games, uh, every game is a language in itself. I think, I like to think it that way. So, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not easy to tell because there will always be someone coming with a new thing, a new way to intend the game that will just like make your mind blow. And, uh, and so, you know, it's like, it might be about mechanics, but it's not necessarily all the time about mechanics. Mechanics are really important because they are the verbs that we use in, we use in that language. So the choice of that word, verbs uh, and words are, are extremely important. So game mechanics for sure are, are among uh, important things, but also like really the, the ability of thinking of abandoning some game mechanics and saying, okay, what you do in this game is just look at thing and pay attention. That is a game mechanic, but it's not a game mechanic that is frequently recognized as such or necessarily used that much. So yeah, I think it's time to wrap up. Thank you so much for being here. That's been like a lot of fun. I really loved uh, answering all of your questions actually. <laughs> um, yeah, as I said, we will be back on June the 3rd. Uh, with Alan Pritchard, Head of Digital Arts Computing. Come, please do come. Uh, I hope I can give some other lectures in the future because uh, uh, there are many, many things I would like to talk about. So yeah, uh, have a good rest of your day and hope to see you soon.